I completely wiped the Zoom from my Mac and I did a reinstall and stuff. I cleaned it. So let's see. Uh, I've had it on for some time already and it hasn't done anything. I don't know if it has to do when we connect and we talk for, I don't know. But let's hopefully it lasts long. All right. What up, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report on the Nerd Generation. And today we're going to be talking about Spider-Man No Way Home. And if you've watched the show, we've had our concerns. I no longer concern myself with those concerns. Um, but joining me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, he saw it first. He gave us a great spoiler-free review that I put out a few days ago, or yesterday, I believe. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised that when I came out the out of the theater and I listened to some of the YouTubers that sort of break down the film and I agreed where I felt similar to how they felt and, and, and just sort of made myself aware of some of the Easter eggs as seeing it twice is sort of tough for me, but I am going to go see it again. Um, and then I get a text from Brian. He gives me the numbers, the box office numbers. And he says, I knew it. <laughs> and I was like, there you were spot on with both numbers with both of them was Brian. Tell me, let's talk about the numbers here. The numbers are very important. What do you think about these numbers, even though you, you had a, a good and confident um, um, for, 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 you know, future prediction, you had a good prediction of what the, this movie was going to do. Tell me why in a pandemic and doesn't seem to be really slowing down is actually being looks like it's ramping up and we still got the numbers the type of numbers that we got for this movie talk to me about that talk to me about um let's get let's, let's jump into this movie man yeah so domestic box office is estimated at 253 million dollars for the opening weekend that is the that would be the third highest weekend of all time. I have a sneaky suspicion this might actually pass Infinity War when they do the final numbers, just because Sunday is being projected to be like a 22, 23% decline from Saturday. I bet you it's better than that, just the way the, the buzz has been on this. Um, so you're looking at either way, a movie that is in the class of basically Infinity War, Endgame, and Force Awakens. That's basically your group of movies that have touched kind of the 250 opening weekend. Global is just a shade under 600 million. And that obviously includes some fairly significant COVID restrictions around theater capacity in Europe in particular. Um, so you're looking at at least the projections I've seen is that this has a shot maybe finishing around $1.7 billion global. I think with no pandemic, definitely you would have had 2 billion. Like if Europe was full go, if Asia was full go, definitely two billion would have happened. So you probably the fact that you're going to get over one five in this climate says a lot about this film and people's appetite for it. But look, I think what it comes down to, I you know, I saw the early tracking numbers on Thursday. I gave you the anecdote in my spoiler-free review that you know a theater which literally has had no activity. I, I literally could go to these movies, you know, five minutes before and be one of five people in the theater on opening night, all of them. For that to be sold out was immediately a sign to me that, A, you know, I don't want to get into a political discussion, but people are just more apt to do their thing yeah. at this point, you know? And, and I think, I also think that, I think there's a little urgency that you're seeing some governments, you know, put some restrictions in place. I do think there's some people that are like, I want us to see this movie. I waited a long time to see this movie. My kids want to see this movie. We're going to see this movie. And if they close the theater, I got to get to this movie now in case I can't go in a couple of weeks. I think all that fit. Also, no streaming, obviously. You know, there's no option. You had to go see it big screen. Yeah. And then you got the, you got the reviews. 
um, which I think really were a factor here, like people loving this movie. And I think loving it against the art, right? I think a lot of people had our concerns. A lot of podcasts, you know, that are out there, YouTubers that are out there, had similar concerns. This idea that this thing looked too packed, too crowded, and didn't have the buildup that Infinity War and Game had to where you felt like it was ready for that. Yeah. Um, and so when the reviews came out, I think that fed into it. Um, and I think on top of it, it's you're seeing this culture of movie theater experiences being eventized more and more and more. And, you know, that may be the biggest legacy of the MCU is like just as a comparison, right? Like yeah. the weekend before you have West Side Story come out, Steven Spielberg, probably the great, you know, maybe the greatest living director, right? 96% Rotten Tomatoes. West Side Story is a known brand, albeit in a genre. $100 million budget yeah. does 10 yeah. million bucks. Open yeah. Nobody cared. And I bet you it has a great second life on streaming and all that. Oh, hell yeah. But that oh, yeah. underscores people don't want to go to the movies to see mu a musical. They want to go to the movies to see Spider-Man. Yeah. and his friends and his enemies and they want to go see the Avengers and they want to go see Star Wars and they want to, you know, it takes a lot for people to feel like they need to go to movies now. And so I think this, after a fairly lackluster year for the industry, this was the Avengers of this year. This was the Star Wars of this year. This yeah. was the one big giant event that brought everyone together. And I think you put all that in a pot and it's like, and as I said, this thing appeals to all ages and all generations and you get numbers that basically look like we don't have any sort of pandemic going on. Yeah, yeah. Listen. When the same, it was the same indicator. Most of the time, uh, you know, I buy my tickets pretty quick as soon as they're available. And as of late, I haven't been doing that because every time I buy a ticket, there's so many seats available. And I, for the past three movies, I've been able to sit exactly where I want. This one, this one, it changed a bit. So I knew then that, I mean, again, we've been talking like, hey, Brian, there's no denying that this movie was high. It's difficult to do, to live up to it. And they did that with flying colors. Um, let's, is, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to the business side of, of this. Um, we can certainly move on to the actual film. Yeah, let's do that. Because I think the business side will come back at the end. Because yeah. I do think the way this film, and, you know, spoilers are coming. So yeah, yeah. So by, the way, by the way this film Spoiler. ended has a lot to do with the business of Spider-Man. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Really yes. yes. Um, let me just add, it is so difficult to, you know, reboot a character that... Um, had two previous bad endings, right? Spider-Man 3, Amazing Spider-Man 2. And then we get John Watts, who, who I'm sure we'll have a conversation in a bit, and, and his future, and his future. Because it's, it's, it's this guy is the guy. Um, but... Uh, to be able to put Spider-Man where he seemingly has always been top tier character. But to make him even bigger, that's tough to do, man. That's really tough to do. But let's get into the film. Um, I don't know if you want to like go. I guess we're going to talk about mostly some of the surprises in this film, right? Um, the moments in this film that we enjoyed the most. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the performances uh, and characters that I think did a hell of a job. And some that 
were there and you understood why they were there and it didn't bother you because it wasn't a bad performance, neither here nor there. It was, you know, it was it, it, it was what it was. But um, everything else sort of made up for any little things that you may have found um, um, have a negative feeling towards. Um, so, Brian, I know this one moment that we both have in common. And that was Mr. Charlie Cox. Shouts to our shouts to our, um, our sources. Yes, Perfect. we've been call, we've been calling this. Episode, okay? <laughs> we've been yeah, hey, we've been calling this for months already. We have we t- we said hey, Charlie Cox is in this film. It's confirmed. I got confirmation, right? Um, and by the got, way, by yeah. the way, I think it's funny that you're starting here. This is not the first podcast about this movie where Charlie Cox has actually been in the leadoff spot. So that actually says something yeah. about that character and the way it was reintroduced. That yeah. like in a movie with this many performances characters, you, the first thing you want to talk about is actually Matt Murdock. Yeah. And the way they did it was beautiful. Perfect. It's like no build up here. <laughs> That's how it felt like, oh, like, oh, snap. And you get the crowd reaction. How was your crowd when they saw that? Um, a little slow to realize it. So I knew who it was the second okay. the cane appeared. I was like, oh, okay. I think people waited till the pan up to his face. And then there was some reaction. And then obviously when he catches the, the brick, whatever it is, which I thought was phenomenal. Like what a great way to kind of, both reacted to that. Right? Didn't need the uniform, right? Didn't need the costume, but like it gave that moment of he is Daredevil, and you see Tom Holland's like reaction, and it was like this is perfect. And this, <laughs> of course, I saw this the day after the Kingpin photo from Hawkeye. You know, so I'm already riding high from like, all right, D'Onofrio is physically coming into this show, and then you get Matt, I see you know Matt Murdock the next day, and that's part of why I texted you. I was like, to me, in a weird way, this was like my number one moment because it was like formal announcement of Marvel bringing back the best of the Netflix shows. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the key word, the best of the Netflix shows. We'll we'll see in the future where this goes. Um, And I'm certainly, we have to sort of ask the question that perhaps at some point um, with X-Men as well. We'll talk about that some, at some point. Um, to me, the, to me, the next favorite moment for me was the fight between Doc Ock and and and, and Peter Parker. Did you have any other moments before that um, scene? Um, I mean, I think yeah, I love that scene. Uh, Molina, Molina's great. Um, yeah, and we'll talk more about I think him and some of the other performances. But I think this movie, if I think about like how did this movie pull off what it pulled off. It did a really nice job of giving Peter and MJ room to breathe yeah. throughout the film. And so in the beginning, I kind of liked that they they really picked it up right where we left off with Mysterio having him and then kind of J. Jonah Jameson branding him a murderer. But then, you know, it, it really skips to him and MJ and they're they're sort of dealing with that and their connection. And yeah. um, I think, you know, like I said, this film's best moments are not in the fights. The fights are actually good. There's yeah. some really fun moments there, but I think the best moments in this film are, are the, di- the dialogue and sort of the emotional side. Yeah, yeah. So I think good choices. Well, I want to talk about Chris McKenna and Eric Summers, who are newer writers to these types of films, but I mean, I, I can't say enough about how they kind of wove and navigated something that was incredibly difficult to kind of get us from point A to point B in, in such a fun fashion, two and a half hours. So that's my only general one, is just his chemistry, which we know in real life is real. Tom Holland's diet are dating. And yeah. so we see kind of that chemistry on display in sort of a very quiet way before things explode, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I, I think why I, I think the Doc Ock and uh, Spider-Man uh, fight sequence I liked is not because of the action, but because of Spider-Man 
trying to figure out how to beat him and he can't beat him and he loses that first initial. And, and then they find a clever way of him sort of turning the tables. Um, but it speaks to the cartoons, all the animation and how Spidey is when he fights. It takes him a bit to figure it out as we see again when he fights Doctor Strange, <laughs> which which was like, wow, you know, and, and it shows to and it speaks against to the, the brilliance of Peter Parker, which we'll later see again in the Easter egg. Um, so outside of that, um, what was another uh, specific moment that you remember that I, I, I thought, listen, I don't necessarily want to get into the characters now, but I thought William Defoe's Green Goblin was um, one of the highlights of, of, of this film. Yeah, no, I think I think the moments that were really, like I said, I, I try to tease it without giving it away, but the moments that really sort of sink in are when he's, first when he's catching and retrieving the various villains into like Doctor Strange's jail. If you yeah, 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 yeah. And But then you... For the first time, you're just you're seeing like Molina and Defoe and Fox and Hayden Church, even though he's a sand guy, it's still his voice, like and they're talking to each other. And you're like, this is 20 years worth of Spider-Man, and these are all guys who have either won or been nominated for Oscars, and they're mm-hmm. just talking. And they're but they're finding like little nuances in the characters they played a long time ago, which is key to this working. Um, I think some did it better than others. We'll talk yeah. about that. Um, but I think that moment, I think in, the other one is is when they're in um, Happy Hogan's apartment. Mm-hmm. It's amazing yes. there. And it's like, it is, the dialogue is just, it's just watching. It's like, you can say the same, we can say the same lines, but we don't have their acting talent. So when they say the lines, it just... It of course, happens. of and course. So I think those moments were really... Nostalgic, and I, I give the writer, this is one thing I give the writers a lot of credit for, is they did not waste time assuming you didn't know who these people were or what they did. Yeah. This movie bet on the fact that even 20 years later, you have seen yes. Sam Raimi Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2 and Amazing Spider-Man. And Am- There's a bet there because they don't really tell you anything about that, that it, yeah. it's little nuggets and anecdotes but mm. this movie really assumed even if you're not a fan you kind of know who they are yes and i don't have to waste time explaining it to you and exactly. i thought that was a huge choice because i think this movie yes, would have bogged yes, down yes, yes, they yes, gone yes. and try to flash back and do all that this yeah. movie would have been much slower and much worse so yeah. i love that they just, just did that They're like, here are these guys you know who they are yeah like, yeah yeah why do you think it is that they uh, changed uh, Jamie Foxx's appearance? Uh, why did they really do it? Or why did they do it? Because the real reason is I don't think he would have come back if they had. I'm sure that like if he had to be the blue guy again, which wasn't well received, yeah. prosthetics and the makeup time, yeah. it's not coming back. Yeah, in yeah. fact, I've seen an interview. Watch the, watch the villains panel. There's one on YouTube with the three of them, uh, Defoe. Mm-hmm. Molina and Fox were there. And he talks about Amy Pascal's pitch. And you know, literally the first thing out of his mouth is she pitched me that I wouldn't have to be blue anymore. I wouldn't have to do that. Yeah. So I think a lot of it was just like he didn't want to reprise a character people didn't like. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to spend as much time in the makeup to make him more. And what I think personally think he was the least success or one of the least successful of the people they brought back. Yeah. But in the end of the day, I think they basically said, here, we'll give you some money. Go be Jamie Foxx. Go be the best of Jamie Foxx, and we'll give you a better costume. Yeah. That's kind of what it feels like to me. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. That, I, that sounds about right. Um, but you're right. Um, a lot of the great moments in this film don't happen uh, in action sequences. It's just those moments where people are talking. And this is something, Brian, that um, I'm, I'm skipping ahead, but this is something that for some time I sort of was a bit conflicted as to why this and is why this isn't a part of his story. And I'm referring to Uncle Ben. Yep. 
Um, instead, they flipped it and gave Peter the words that we are so familiar with when they're said and instantly think of Spider-Man. She was the one that delivered those lines. How did you feel about it initially? And had and and I don't know how, what you think about it now, but has it changed? I think it works for this particular iteration. Um, you, there has been no Uncle Ben character. There's no room for it now. Uh, had they tried to introduce it in this movie, I think that also would have been a mistake. Yeah, Marissa Tomei is the logical character to hold that role. And I thought that her, you know, her death scene is pretty harrowing. I mean, from the moment she's hit by the glider. And I remember like she, the way she was hit by the glider, I'm like, oh, she's, she's done. done and then yeah. they actually had her get up and I'm like, nah, yeah, not really yeah I was a little bit right. Yeah, I yeah, could yeah. see she was hurt, but I was like, they're not really going to let her be <laughs> And then of course it, it, it pays off with that, with that moment. But then I think whether by design from homecoming or not, I think it wound up being more powerful in a way that when Toby Maguire appears to relay his Uncle Ben story, it actually works better that we're, that Tom Holland doesn't have his own Uncle Ben, that it's yeah. actually a different person in his life who gave him the same message yeah, yeah. and then died. Or I think it actually worked really well that like their stories were not parallel tracks. With yes. the same person. So in a weird way, that's where I feel like it enhanced after the fact yeah. that it was Aunt May who actually said that to him before she I don't know what did you did it was it jarring for you to have her say it to him as opposed to an uncle? It wasn't jarring. Um it just made me think a bit as to why they made that decision. And I think I instantly, once the movie was over and I, you know, because I didn't want to spend time thinking about that while I was watching the movie. But uh, later on, I sort of understood why they made that choice and why it, only, it, it made sense. Um, it, but it wasn't it, it wasn't jarring. I think it, it was appropriate. And, and 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 you would understand why Peter would take those words uh, seriously, because she's sort of been. Telling him before, you know, help one person, you, you know. And sort of it led up to that. These are were pretty much almost her final words, right? Um, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, they pretty much are. I mean, I think one of the things that becomes very apparent by the end of this movie is that we've been watching three movies with Spider-Man in the title, but he's not actually Spider-Man until this movie. Oh, yes. This is... The way, and so that line and that moment, I think, are very significant catalysts for realizing that Tom Holland's kind of had the training wheels on. That's the way they want you to think about him yeah. because of Stark Tech, because of he's been in the Avengers. He has had this support system that no one else in the other Spider Verse has had, yeah. which becomes apparent in this film. And then you're like, even though you call him Spider Man because you know that's who he is he doesn't actually become Spider-Man until about that moment. Yeah. He goes through that loss. He suffers that tragedy. And all of a sudden, like he then has to redeem himself. He almost obviously commits revenge. And then like, he, he will get to the very end of the movie, but all of it is like, he's grown up now. No matter how old he actually is in the story, like he is actually a grown up. And now he actually is Spider-Man in the classic. Yes. <sighs> Not to skip ahead, but you can sort of see that there was a lot of uh, agreement in how and what we saw in that final scene yeah, of, uh, of Spider Man. Um, yo, it looked it looked iconic to me. It looked iconic. I mean, it was like from like Spider Man One. It was like, yeah, finally we got like the true. After all these movies, we finally got like the homemade costume that looks exactly comic accurate. Yeah. Hey, that that's and, and and again, like you said, man, that you can't give it up to, to the writers enough for what they were able to accomplish, especially with the three Spider-Man um 
and given them all their unique, because all of them were awkward. All of them had their sort of uh, dark side. All, some of them had their, their, you know, the humorous Spider-Man. Some did it better than others, you know. And I, and, and I think Andrew Garfield, is, for me, is, is, is number one. But they were all different in, in, in how they portrayed those characteristics. And, but they had a lot of the same sort of, I guess, life lessons. Um, it was not until he lost May with all those three connected. They lost those, those, you know, those individuals in their lives for him, for Andrew Garfield, it was Gwen for Peter. It was Ben. And for Tom, it was on May. Right. Some people are going to probably say Tony Stark, but no, at least not, not, not in my opinion. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, yeah, there's a lot to say about the three Spider-Men, how they were introduced and how they were used. Um, I think the best thing I can say is McKenna and Summers clearly not only understand the character, they understand the movies that we've been given. This movie doesn't work the way it does unless they get the joke. And yeah. I said this in the spoiler for your review. I, I trust that you agree. A lot of this dialogue and a lot of the puns and a lot of the gags and a lot of the history really is in line with what fans have said through the years. They poke yeah. fun at the, they poke fun at Paul Giamatti's Rhino. They poke yeah. fun at the stuff that people didn't like. They put, you know, and they poke fun at Tobey Maguire's back, which he threw out in the original filming. Like that. Yeah. So the, there's so many little things that the writers wove in to acknowledge the fan base. And that's yeah. what I said. Like, you laugh at this movie if you don't know anything about the history. You really laugh at it if you know the history because it's yeah. really been given to you. Yeah. And so I think the spider man in particular bring that to life because I think the writers understood the strengths of Maguire and of Garfield in their portrayal of the character, but also understood the fan perception of both of those franchises at the time. And so they yeah. don't try to, you know... Um, override that like yeah. toby mcguire still toby mcguire like he plays it as an older version of the peter parker that we had 20 yeah. years ago it's not like a fully different character um and it plays to some of his strengths a guy who's sort of very friendly you know a little bit more passive yeah. um whereas garfield was the more emotional one and probably was the best all around i don't yeah. know that's too controversial the best all around peter parker in part because <laughs> he was the biggest fan of the character yeah, yeah, yeah. So he right. understood it. And yeah. I think to your point, like, I mean, this was, you know, what I found myself thinking about watching him was Hayden Christensen, because if you want the best ending for Hayden Christensen, it's this, it's, it's what Garfield pulls off in this movie where he comes back, mm -hmm. reminds you of how great he was at the character mm -hmm. and almost has this, this redemption arc of not just his, movie character but in a meta way yeah his actual films and his role in the films and yeah. i'm like i was just like and i don't know if christensen's as good an actor as garfield we'll see like i'm hopeful that that's how we come to look at and because i kind of left this movie i don't know if you were the same where i'm like you know if we're in a multiversal world they want to bring garfield back to do one i was just thinking i would get i was just waiting for you to, for you to finish so i can say just ask you i was going to ask you this Andrew Garfield, Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man 3 or whatever, would you watch it? Absolutely. Is that absolutely? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they're thinking this. Andrew Garfield would love to come back to this. Andrew Garfield, if they, if they saw the same sort of, um, I guess, TLC that they had for this movie and they do it for give it for, because Andrew Garfield is the, although the movies weren't like the best ever or whatever, and there weren't nothing like that. But you remember him as Spider-Man. He was memorable as a Spider-Man. And I would definitely want to see him again with this sort of writing. I'm all, I'm all for it. Were you surprised they were in the movie as much as they were? No. Yeah, we had that suspicion. But I think a lot of people thought it was going to be more cameo or smaller. And this was yeah, a, no. these were real parts. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Um, it's this is top shelf. This is top shelf. Well, it also MCU. doesn't work if they don't have fun being around each other. Yeah. And I think like even from the minute they bring Andrew Garfield through the portal and then Toby McGuire shows up in time. And I think it's an interesting decision. Tom Holland's not present, right? So the first time you see, it's like, all right, we're gonna give you two of them. We're gonna give you the old two, have them interact. And it works. They have yeah. chemistry. They have they have fun. And then they bring Tom Holland in to make it the trio. And the three of them have chemistry. It's different. But, you know, as I said, the, the writing is at its strongest when they're delivering their parallel experiences, what they learn, differences. So it starts with the tragic, but it's just as great when it's funny. I love the moment when they're on the, the Statue of Liberty and they're like, you want an alien in space? You want an alien in space? Like, that is hilarious. Like, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. good when they're talking about like being Spider-Man in a very cavalier way and like what of they course. do. Or, or remembering that, yes, Peter was part of a team. These other two guys were solo acts. I love that. Great. I love that. Great touch. I love that. stink at being a team in the outset of the final battle. Yeah, and, and making Tom, because he has that experience, and, 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 and as well as um, being amongst leaders, Cap, Iron Man, and others, he he said, "Let's do this," and I know how to do it. You know, I've done it before, and and I just I just love that that interaction and that 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 leadership role that Tom Holland and and Spider Man the character has had in pivotal moments in the MCU. Yeah, 100%. and not even in the MCU in in, in, the, in the comics. One hundred percent. And then I loved obviously in the final battle that they gave each Spider Man something very personal to their own movie journey, right? So I, I absolutely, I don't know how your theater was, but I loved I mean, Garfield saving MJ. And oh, yeah. Crying I was, I was, uh, was just like one of the, that's like one of the all-time moments that we've seen. Yeah. Um, and then even I thought the way they, you know, having McGuire be the one who saves Holland from committing murder at the end, it, it really harkened back to, if you remember in, in the Raimi movies, you know, kind of Peter Parker's undying support and love for Harry, right? Even though Harry tries to kill him and he tries to kill Harry and like, and then at the end, they're kind of on the same. He had that look on his face that we saw so many times in those films of sort of like, no, there's always, you, this isn't right. You know, it's not right. And mm -hmm. there's a good way to handle this. So they each got that bit of closure, if you will, um, that I thought was really, really fun, really fun to see. So I, again, I think it's, this, it's not so much that the individual effects are amazing, but the moments and the staging of what they're given to do in the final battle is incredibly well thought out. Yeah. Andrew Garfield finding Mary Jane. Because <laughs> you lost Gwen. And obviously in the comics, there's, there was Gwen and then there was Mary Jane. It'll be interesting if he goes back to his will, having that thought of this part, there's, there's hope for me. You know, um, you talk about the villains. So let's go back to the villains for a second. Okay. Rank order. So in your mind, who kind of won the battle of the villains? Like bringing back these actors, who in your mind like walked off with the trophy of like the best reprise of their character? To me, is no question William Defoe. His personification of the Green Goblin was what I would expect to see live action. Um, the look on his face when he's getting beat the first time. Um, and you can certainly tell that at the end of that, that, that final um, fight sequence between Goblin and Peter, Tom Holland's Spider-Man, he wasn't pulling any punches. It didn't, I, I, I very highly doubt that he was pulling punches. And, you know, Green Goblin was still intact, so it speaks to almost his invulnerability somewhat. Um, so I thought, so I agree with you. Yeah. When Spider-Man came out in 2002, Defoe's performance was more criticized than, I think if you go back and read the reviews, I think there was a view that he, he was uncomfortable in the role. He did some, the way he did kind of as Norman Osborn versus like talking to the mask or then what he became when he had the mask on. I don't think it worked for everyone. 
I mean, I don't know if how many people remember that, but that was, he was not seen as a strong point of that move. But he gave an interview, yeah, when, maybe when it was first rumored that he might be coming back, mm -hmm. years, in which he indicated, similar to Michael Keaton, and we're going to see Michael Keaton's version of this in Flashpoint, that he had thought about the character and his portrayal of it in the last 20 some odd years where he felt like if he got another chance to do it, he had something. And I think we saw it. He was yeah. better as this version of the character than the 2002 version. The evil was more evil and believable. Yes. The innocent was more believable as well, where he yes. tricks kind of Peter early on. So I actually found myself thinking, like, had this Defoe been in the 2002 Spider-Man, actually, that's, that movie, which was already great, would have actually been elevated even more. So I agree with you. He... He clearly studied his own performance and tweaked it to, to give us what, what we it was did. less goofy. Well, he's was, evil. Yeah. He is. He is he, not cool. Yeah. This one when he turns. Yeah. yeah. But um, even if, even if, but do you, did you still think that before he was cured, do you think, do you still think that they, he was struggling with? The I, I, I let's say the good side versus the Green Goblin side. You think yeah, there was a struggle was a, or there manipulation? There was a piece of that that was genuine, but I think you know he turned clearly a lot quicker than we were shown on screen because Peter picks up on it and catches him. But yeah. yeah, no, I think there was some genuine struggle when he destroys the mask in the alley. Like he clearly is is fighting it. So I mean, that's part of the character. Although in fairness, like Norman Osborn wasn't exactly like a hero either. Like Norman Osborn's kind of a, eh, like as a, as a dad yeah. and as a character, but he's just brilliant as a scientist. So yeah. I actually thought, you know, they really played on the redemptive qualities of Doc Ock. Molina mm -hmm. actually is, you know, a quote second in my mind in this movie, in part because by repairing him first, you get to see more of sort of Otto Octavius that we saw at the beginning of Spider-Man 2. Yeah. Uh, and someone who's more hopeful and actually winds up being heroic in the end, yeah. which kind of was teased at the end of Spider-Man 2, even though he is trying to, you know, power the sun on my hand, that whole thing. Yeah. But um, so I really like that Molina had that that duality as well from just sort of trying to kill Peter to confirming what we saw in the trailer, which was that he, as a scientist, was like, this makes no sense. How do I think through this? And then you see the better side of him kind of come out and almost this like boyish like how cool is this that i'm surrounded by all these other characters <laughs> so yeah no i, I really i really, really like uh, the two of them and i think the writers again look all of the actors in this movie are accomplished but everyone's got to get their big boy pants on which is that green goblin and doc ock are just more important villains in the spider verse yeah. than these other guys. so you yeah. know what we have five, not six, we have five villains to deal with. We're going to have headliners. And those are the two headliners. Yeah. And all you other guys, even if it's Jamie Foxx, even if it's Thomas Hayden Church and Reese Fonz, you also got, you're going to fall in line as supporting cast. Exactly. Exactly. Because they did not try to force like, hey, let's make it be democratic. And they all need to have the same amount of time. What did you think of Tobey Maguire's performance? You know, I thought it was good. I mean, for a guy who doesn't act anymore, and don't underrate that, who basically hasn't been on screen at all in five years, like I said, I like the fact that he basically was like, his universe's Peter was, I figured out how to make it work with MJ. I kind of conquered, you know, kind of my demons. And I'm kind of just an older version of the character you left, which is sort of a positive one. Um, I love that they gave him crap, which was really funny. Like Garfield making fun of him, calling him a used pastor. Before <laughs> it was epic. Um, so I, I don't think he, I think he got upstaged a little bit by Garfield. Garfield was definitely the best of the three, I think. But I think for what he was asked to do, this was clearly the like the world of Spider-Man that ended well. He had a relatively, that was implied that he kind of had a relatively happy ending and had been doing this for a long time. And uh, I think you played it that way. Did you have an issue with kind of what he was doing? Or? I mean, I guess when you put it that way, it makes sense. He's, in my opinion, he's, he, I, I like him the least. He was good for that time because we didn't have anyone really to compare him to. 
that was good as a Spider-Man. He was the best at that time. And he's I enjoyed the least and, comics accurate Peter Parker. Yes. Yes. That, I mean, that's just true. Yeah. I think he I think he's a he's his version of the character is a good on screen persona, but if you're a dedicated fan of the comics, he's the least faithful to Yeah. Yeah. But I think it would have been weird had they made him more comics accurate and had him wisecracking a lot more now because he never did that. Yeah. So do we agree Fox is the one that worked the least of the villains? Or or, or Yeah, I didn't, I didn't I didn't I didn't I didn't really I I I took him as as is. I, I didn't enjoy his performance. Not saying that it was bad, but I just didn't enjoy it. You I know, just know that the character is all that awesome, you know, and they've done yeah. they tried it twice now, and it's like there's a reason why Electro is a known character, but not necessarily a top build character as as top villain opposite Spider Man. So I don't know. I think we're I think we have to run his course. They didn't really they gave Lizard almost nothing to do, so I don't really know if there's anything to say there. And are you surprised there was no vulture? Are you surprised there wasn't a sixth in this movie? I don't I I, I took it as they don't want to play all their cards right now. Eventually, they're going to tease it. Who takes the charge in that and how they, I mean, we got to see how this goes and, and how this gets developed. But I still think um, they're leading towards it. They just didn't want to show their hand now. Um, so, yeah, that's what I got out of that. Yeah, I, the only thing I could think of was they wanted to draw a clean line between the Holland verse and the other verses. And if they had brought in Vulture, that was from the Holland verse. And so they wanted, so then it would be like if you're going to do a six villain, your choices would have been Hob, like a Harry Osborne Hobgoblin or a Dane DeHaan Hobgoblin. Um, Paul Giamatti's Rhino, which obviously that ain't happening based upon the dialogue in this movie. And then what we saw later on in the one of the final scenes, which I want to talk about. Um, so I, I kind of feel like with or or and they couldn't do this, it would have been like the Topher Grace Venom. You know, I think those would have been your options for the six, given the way they wrote this movie. So that's my theory as to why you didn't see Keaton or didn't see, you know, a Mysterio resurrection. It was that they didn't want to bring someone who was in the Holland verse already back to life. Or yeah. in this case of, of Keaton out of jail. Before we move on to the future uh of this franchise. Uh, what did you think of the the final performance between uh, Zendaya and uh, Mary J- uh, MJ and Spider Man and the whole spell thing? What would what, what did you what were your uh, thoughts on how they pulled that off? You know what? Let's talk about Doctor Strange. So the spell thing is clearly there to do a couple things for the business. That's kind of how I walk away thinking about it mm-hmm. um and i think the two moments where that's really made clear are when the when the multiverse fractures and you can see the outline of these other characters who I'm guessing we will see at some point so you see an outline of rhino you see an outline of craven you see an outline of black cat so i'm guessing these are characters we will get in the sony verse at some point and then of course the spell itself, which is the reset, and which the reset I think is absolutely something that Sony and Marvel probably had a long talk about before yeah. settling on this as the solution. Yeah. So, so Doctor Strange is the vehicle for that. He's really the only person. I mean, the only people who could do it in the universe would be Strange or Wanda, and they can't be Wanda because of where we left her in Wanda. Correct. So it has to be Strange. Yeah. Uh, I mean, other than that. I don't know how, I mean, Strange was giving a lot of exposition. He's also there to explain what's going on. Yes. He's like a narrator. Yes. I'm kind of glad they kept him out of the broader action. Like they gave him his cool set piece with Spider-Man, but I think he would have actually been in the way if he was actually in the fight at the end. Yes. So again, good decision by the writers to use him and then sideline him mm-hmm. as opposed to being like, hey, we need, we need Sorcerer Supreme to kind of unleash on these dudes, you know, at the end. So I don't yeah. know what you felt, but it felt like if anything, I probably could have used a touch less of Cumberbatch in this movie, but mm-hmm. um, I think they they went right to the limit of what was okay. Uh, I didn't miss him, 
and uh, and it was just a great way of them inserting reinserting him into the fold. I guess when the thing breaks, right, the box breaks. Yeah. Once that, um, once that's destroyed, hence Doctor Strange returns, and which makes perfect sense. And they did a fantastic job in in, in doing that whole thing. Were you okay with Spider Man defeating him in the mirror dimension? Yeah. Like outsmarting him that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even though he he clearly is much more powerful and that would have to be maintained. He he basically beats him with math, as he said. So. Yeah, I mean, at the at the end of the day, I mean, it's not like Doctor Strange was looking to kill him or anything like that or do something so so harmful, right? He was just trying to stop him and he was un, unable to because Spider-Man beat him, uh, you know, and and... Again, this calls back to the fight between Doc Ock. It takes him a little bit to sort of figure it out. Once he figures it out, he he executes, hits his thoughts on it, and and it pans out. And that's that's what I loved about his fight sequences the most is that he goes through that progression, and 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 he figures it out while having to go to great lengths to 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 killing anyone, right? Yeah, let me let me let's talk about the fight sequences in general in one sense. You hit on something I really thought was a good choice here and I liked, which is that this version of Spider-Man, because we've always seen him for the most part with help, he's always had Iron Man or he's had uh, Nick Fury or what he thought was Nick Fury or the Avengers, right? I like the fact that he got beat up in this movie. I like the fact that it was him against tall odds with no help. And he took a lot of punishment. Yeah. I thought that was the right choice. Had he been, you know, like one step faster or like always kind of cleanly just getting away, I would have been like, mm, you, you yeah, know, you got to take a punch here. But he took a lot of damage in this movie. And I always actually thought, that even with the equipment that he had, yeah. he was yeah. constantly losing his armor and like bleeding and like getting beat up. Um, I guess. Yeah, like, how, how, did you feel like they got the right balance of like Tom Holland's skills versus kind of his vulnerability in this? Yeah, yeah. Um, because again, even a spider gets crushed, a real life spider who has these sort of um, um, these spider senses and are able to get away, they get you know beat up every once in a while, right? So um and he was and they showed they showed him getting beat up and sort of being resilient and 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 figuring out um i guess the next time how not to take that punishment or how to fight him next so is he like like you said before the spider-man at the end of this film is the iconic spider-man that everybody knows and this was just sort of his training uh, I guess we saw him in the beginning of his career, pretty much. We saw that progression, which is very rarely, we always skip like 10, five years with this one. It was, you seen his progression into what we get now. And it's like, this was sort of leads us to what we get now going f- further is something that I thought would never happen. And I guess Kevin and the and, and the Parliament and, and the people over at Sony realize that there's it's better to be cool than go our separate ways and be greedy, right? Because <laughs> that's what essentially if Sony would have ended their partnership with with Marvel to do their own thing and and and, and just not be associated with them, it's just being greedy. I think that's right, but I do think the, the way it's written was designed to maximize the optionality, right? So the spell of forgetting Peter Parker at the end wipes out all connection to the Avengers in the sense of known connection, right? Like the, the, none of those yeah. characters know him anymore. The Stark connect is not available to him anymore. It wipes out all of kind of like loose ends from the 616 universe that he's been a part of. And it basically reverts him to a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man who's alone with yeah. no pre-existing relationships. Yeah. And that to me is all about 
we can do what we want next without having to write our way out of a problem from the prior films. So whether it's Sony, whether it's Marvel, it is the definition of the clean slate. Yeah. Like remember, was it in a Dark Knight Rises? That was what Catwoman was after, the clean slate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, is, this, this is, is it right here. <laughs> Where nobody knows who you are. Yeah, exactly. But that, and to your point, it's such a great, these movies struggle so often to end. And I think they found a way to end this movie. I think this, that's why I said the scene in the coffee shop is one of the best scenes in the movie because mm-hmm. it's the grown up superhero moment where you're like, you sacrifice the things you love and you sacrifice the things you want for yourself because you see your friends are happy. Yeah. You know, and so he has that prepared speech that he pockets. And at that moment, you're like, yeah, he's full on Spider Man. He's in the, he's in, the dual life, you know, the the hidden existence and the alter ego, and 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 then he goes out on the streets with his homemade costume, and he's going to make a difference as the friendly neighborhood Spider Man. Yeah. Um, and it's just it's perfect. It's like it's the it's the it's the best way to take this huge scale and just bring it back down to the streets and have it end in a very sort of comics accurate way. Yeah, I agree with you one hundred percent, and I think this also perhaps puts them in a position where if they go forward with this which I I hope they do is that he'll be more uh, careful with his secret identity. We won't see the taking off of the masks constantly, right? We will see more Peter Parker when he's Peter Parker, he's Peter Parker. When he takes off his mask, he's done for the day. He's not running around in the street with his mask in his hand. Yeah. (laughs) No more. You know, and that's what I think that's one of the the, the problems I've always had with the Spider-Man franchise is that he's constantly taking off his mask, you know. Um, But yeah, that yo, let me ask. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure, sure. I just want to see if they work for you. Mm -hmm. This movie went out of its way to really focus on like the hero's choice, right? The what the ant the Aunt May message, right? That everyone deserves to be saved. Were you okay with that when it came to all these villains? Like the fact that Peter basically jeopardizes the entire world initially to help his friends because they didn't get into college. And then ultimately it's because he's not morally okay with sending them, sending the villains all back to die in their respective universe. Were you okay with the amount of havoc that he was willing to cause to effectively give the bad guys a second chance? I think I'm influenced into the Spider-Man that does whatever he can to help people because of, I guess, the, the, the things that I've seen with the, the, the character in, in animation, in, in comics, and things that I've enjoyed where he does whatever he can to help people, right? Uh, if you watch, if you watch the the Spider Man, the, I think is uh, the the one on Fox. It's all about that. He's always trying to help somebody. Morbius, uh, all of his Doc Ock, all of he's always trying to help somebody, and so it didn't feel as if, for me, it felt like he doesn't want to help them. Is we're still we're still the Spider Man that doesn't really get it yet. He doesn't understand that him being who he is, he can't have the life that he wants. So it wasn't, I I was fine with it. Or do you think there, so the, the reset spell wiped the slate clean. That being said, do you think we will see any future ramifications from that choice? Because he succeeds in curing effectively these villains and then sending them back to their proper universes, which will alter the ending that we knew, or at least we thought we knew from some of those films. Do you think that will be dealt with at some point? Not necessarily that we would bring back Defoe again or bring back Molina again, but this idea that like someone could emerge from one of those universes because Doc Ock never became Doc Ock or what, or what have you. Like, I don't know, is that, are we totally done with that? Or do you think they left that open as like an app? I, I mean, I thought about it, and it's like, what if this affected Andrew Garfield and Peter Parker? Do they go back? Nobody knows them, and do do 
these characters that are sort of rehabilitated. I think for Doc Ock and William Defoe, I think the, the, the eventuality with Doc Ock's ambition is over overpowering his sort of, uh, I guess, um, it, it, it um, affects his better judgment, I guess. Right. That ambitious part of Doc Ock and that part of Norman Osborn that was there, I think, even before the serum. So is a part of him anyway. So those characters will certainly eventually, if they decided to go further, would um, be who they are again. And they'll give it a second go at it, especially with Connor. I mean, he, he had his, his arm. I mean, he, there's still potential there. Right. But they, there's a lot of different ways you can go with this, man. Were you OK with Ned being able to use the sling ring? Listen, man, if they do something with him, it better be on Disney Plus. <laughs> or Saturday morning. <laughs> card. You know, it's just. I'm I I wasn't I'm not a big fan of 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 the character that much, you know. I'm I'm, I'm just not, and nothing against him. I I, th- I just don't think the character works for me. But it was probably the least. It was probably the biggest stretch for me in the movie that he could luck his way into opening these portals when in Doc Strange you saw like entire academies of wizards learning how to do it who are learning how to do this over a long period of time and strange himself had to be banished to like siberia <laughs> in order to be forced to learn how to do it. i was like the fact that this kid could just wave his hands and kind of make portals i was like really? he, he he may be he may he may have an ability that's so i'm assuming that was not an accident but like, no i no, feel no. like if you don't explain that now it will be like a cheat code for this movie where I'm like, eh, I don't know. There, there, Ooh, there was apparently it. an Easter egg that pointed towards some history with magic in his family, apparently. Um, but I don't care. I don't, I'm not interested. Yeah, you know. Exactly. So I say be very careful how you do this. If you're yeah. going to do it at all, I, I doubt it. I wouldn't do it, but. But we'll have to just wait and see. Where are we going from here? We got credit scenes, and then we've got sort of where does where does Spider Man go from here? What what, what was the Which first Spider Man are we getting? Yeah, what was the first end credit scene that we got? It was Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy and and the yeah, Venom uh, symbiote being left behind. over after left behind after he is put back in his universe because obviously we know now that it was that spell that caused him to. Um, be in that universe. Even though I don't understand why the other ones had reasons, but why would he, you know? Yeah. That's interesting to me. I didn't love it. Um, that particular scene felt a little bit like, uh, aha, we got you with the scene at the end of Venom 2. Because it was like, he was in the universe and then he was taken back. And the only thing that was left was the symbiote, which is not Tom Hardy. Necessarily. Yeah. So I'm like, eh, you guys kind of got us all, <laughs> all fired up that Tom Hardy was going to go head to head with Tom Hall. And maybe he still will. But what, what we got left with was more that Tom Hardy's back in Venomverse and there's a little bit of the symbiote that's now walking around the hall. It's not necessarily the same character. So eh, I didn't love the first scene, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, to me, it was like this is their way of bringing the symbiote into that world, and 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 not the classic way. Right. Um, yeah, I wasn't. I was left torn, but um, yeah, I was like, whatever. Let, let's see. Let's see where this this ends up. Um, but before we get into the last crit- end credit scene, but th- there was a Easter egg for. Uh, we see a GED textbook, so this is Peter Parker, you know, trying to get his education back up because nobody knows who he is, so he has to sort of amass credentials now, right? Um, but there was also an invitation to some future something. I forget what it's called. Is an organization um, for 
uh, I guess, the uh, Smart Kids, um, and it's founded by Reed Richards. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know. That. Okay. Yeah, that was an Easter egg. Uh, that's why I go and watch the Easter eggs to see because I, I I don't got the time to look through and find all of them. Yeah. Um, I future something future champions what I forget, but it was an organization founded by Reed Richards. So John Watts fingerprints of his work is uh, is coming together and the future for john watts is certainly very very bright if he continues to run that he's on then you never know if one day he may be the successor of kevin feige well i said to you in the in the in the spoiler free review but I'll be curious to your reaction now. How much more excited are you about his Fantastic Four having seen this movie? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Excited? I Because I don't know what... I, I, I guess I would say is I don't know how good of a Fantastic Four... Because to be honest, other than the comics, not in the Fantastic... Nothing... In any other media that the Fantastic Four have been um, premiered, cartoons, whatever, it hasn't been successful, <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm hopeful for it, and 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 certainly not worried too much about. But let's see. Yeah, I, I just it, this this movie, like I said, encouraged me in a way that for that. I'll be honest, you know, I, I really enjoy Homecoming, and I really enjoy Far From Home. But as like Marvel movies that I return to, neither one of them is actually like in my yeah. top tier. Yeah. And this movie just to me in terms of its scale and in terms of its personal interactions, yeah, it just made me more optimistic that this guy could pull this off. Because to me, like I said, Fantastic Four, you got to get your casting right, but you got to get doom right and, yeah. he, and like he got good performances out of the villains in this movie the key villains he really got you know top really good performances from them and just the amount of emotion in like the interaction between the spideys or like or like um, peter parker and aunt may like fantastic four more than any other group like that family dynamic has to work they don't get along they get along there's a lot of infighting in the original comics like you have to nail that and like the movies we've gotten to date have not by any stretch gotten there. Um, so I think just seeing that made me feel like, all right, he's got the DNA here for something that could be interesting. We'll see if it's these writers or whoever it's going to be, but it made me more optimistic that he can handle, you know, what's going to be asked of, of this. And especially because, you know, in some ways that movie is going to be like a little bit like, um, James Gunn Suicide Squad in the sense of it's going to have some bad mojo attached to it before he starts. He's going to have to overcome that to get people to really buy in. Yeah. It'll be interesting because, you know, Spider-Man and Johnny Storm are best friends. So you never know if th those two guys become best friends. And you never know this. I was thinking about this, Brian. What Tom Holland has said some cryptic stuff about perhaps not wanted to come back perhaps this coming together is is has been because of that so let's put holland here because this is clearly his far and away his best effort as the character he's asked to do more he does more he's much more grown up did this movie did you leave this movie wanting to see him as the classic comic Spider-Man grown up. Now, I think it did. I think it's of course. Sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because we want to see what this looks like. For, to me, that's the most one of the uh, enticing aspects of of, uh, of of watching the next chapter in his life because it's, it's brand new. We want to see how he navigates that. What relationship? He, nobody knows him. So he has to get to know everybody for the first time, you know, especially those people that are going to be close to him. Um, Cause I want to see him do the photography thing. If he decides to go there and, and form those relationships with Jay Jonas, imagine Jay Jonas, Jason Jameson is the same. They, they decided to do Tom McGuire and Andrew Garfield, and he's the same guy. <laughs> he's great, by the way. Yeah. is never bad. And like, yeah. he, was, he was as usual, his, his, his great self in this movie in, in the small room. So yeah. I agree with it. Do you want to see, 
the continuation of Holland in this form of Spider-Man more than if they were to introduce Miles Morales, which obviously Jamie Foxx's character teased yeah. very explicitly. Obviously, we know that they're gonna they're, they're heading towards Miles Morales, um, but I'm not in a hurry to see his character just yet, just because everybody wants it now. Um, I, I, I certainly want to see what happens next with Tom Holland, and because as Spider Man and as and you know Fantastic Four and other characters pop up, he's going to be associating with him, himself with those characters. Um, so he could be again one of those. He can be like Iron Man, jumping in other people's film for a spell and then and then bounce. Um, he can be that character. Uh, uh, so it'll be interesting. It, it'll be interesting. I mean, that's certainly a way to do it, Brian. If you wanted to put Tom Holland in for a, a quick cameo and you never see him take his mask off um those these are the moments that you want to do it and in his own film obviously you see him more as peter parker but i want to see how he navigates his work going forward and and, and, and the relationships that he forms you yeah i think this movie i think going into this movie I, i'm always the one who's always like ready to say goodbye to these actors feeling like they've done a good job but like I think this movie hit on something that I think made me want to see more of him. Um, and, and this this independent Spider-Man uh, having to kind of rediscover and rebuild his world. I, I, I don't think they need to rush Miles Morales. Um, I know they keep teasing it. I know it's going to happen. I would be honestly a little bit disappointed if he meets Miles in the next Spider-Man film. I'd, I'd almost rather they hold him back. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm definitely fine if they want to do uh, a few more Tom Hollands built off of where they ended this and have, you know, uh, Zendaya back and, and some of the characters that, that are in the universe still there, but now no longer knowing him, I I'm there for it. So, no, I think, I think Holland actually really, you know, it's funny and far from home, that's where Nick Fury says, are you going to step up? And I feel like this is the movie where Holland really stepped up and was like, yeah, I can, I can carry this. Without, even though I'm surrounded by all this other acting talent, I can carry these relationships and I can carry this character, uh, and they don't need uh, a lot of help to do that. So, what is the likelihood of this actually happening? Your thoughts on that? I think it's high. I mean, I think, you know, I think there was definitely some nervous uh, sentiments around the box office for this. I think now, you know, it'll be expensive, but it's going to get done. And I think you're going to see, like I said, McKenna and Summers as the writers. Um, as I said, I've theorized to you, they have no background in this genre, but they wrote for Community, which is where the Russo brothers came from. I would bet you the Russos you know, are behind why they're here. They're going to get this band back together. Um, John Watts going to be a busy man. I think that might actually might be, in some ways, more interesting than the Holland negotiation because there's a, you know, the way Watts is being set up. Is he going to go to Fantastic Four now? Or is he going to now be forced to do another Spider-Man film because of the success of this? Um, I don't know. But um, not a lot of guys that have, you know, kind of, what is it? What, 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 the three movies are what, a billion, a billion one, and now this one might be one seven? Not a lot of dudes that have that in, in a row for one character. Word. <laughs> Word. <laughs> no. So, yeah, no, I, I think it'll happen. I think a new Holland something will, will happen. Uh, whether it's a trilogy or not, which is what was rumored, we'll see. But so, out of five stars, what do you give it? Yeah, so we took, let's give some awards and ratings. I think for for the overall movie perspective, I'm going four and a half. I think uh, five is reserved for like there's something transcendent in like the Winter Soldier Infinity War. Like there's there's a level of like perfection. Yeah. I don't know if this movie quite quite got all the way there. Um, but I think it did everything it set out to do. And I think in that sense, it is the best thing the industry put out this year. It will be something that I will watch many times very yeah, happily yeah, yeah, when yeah. it's on demand. And you know, I'll go to the theater again, but like when it's on an airplane, like it's just a very easy watch. It's with great performances and a lot of fun. So for me, four and a half. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, that was my same number. That was my same number. It's definitely top shelf. Is a must watch uh, if you're 
a, a fan of this genre. And if you are, you've already seen it. Um, and if you're not, and it's something that you're going to get into, then this is obviously another one. But, you know, so with some of these great films, the caveat is that you have to catch yourself up. Right. With some with some other films. Um, but. It's. There was one time a friend of mine was wanted to see Endgame and he had not seen any of them. He, he had not seen any of the films, but the hype was crazy. So I said, oh, I, I think I'm about to check it out. I was like, yo, don't waste your time. Don't go. You're not going to get what you get went to. You're not going to go get what everybody that's been waiting for this movie is waiting to receive. You're not going to get that. So um, I don't know if he did see it, um, but um, yeah, this is, this is definitely top shelf and I recommend it to everyone. Um, yeah. So is if we assume... Tom Holland is probably your practical MVP just because of what he's asked to do and his part in this movie. Who, who is the best of the rest? Who, who in your mind is the number one for four? It's a tight, I think it's between two and I think it's tight. So who walks off as sort of your, your let's call it your sixth man of the year or sixth man of the movie? AG. Yeah. I think it's close though. Defoe gives him a run. I yes. Think. Yes. He definitely does. But it is Garfield. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. yeah. Tell you, man, Garfield is so underrated, man. Garfield is so underrated. You could have gotten some great, great films out of him. But unfortunately, you know, things went the other way and it was whatever. But Andrew Garfield, man, is, is one of the best Spider-Mans that I enjoyed um, in, in, this, in this franchise. But yeah. I, has, I had mentioned earlier that and not to digress, but I wanted to get your opinion on, even though it's not the same thing, but in terms of rejuvenating a character and making him as the, the best at his most, I guess, most iconic moment or, or, or excitement around the character. Do you think that sort of is sort of something that Batman is going to be able to pull off as well? Or the Batman? I think it's different. Um, I think it's a little different. Uh, I think it will. I think it's a very, I think the movie's trying to accomplish something very different. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to, I think the Batman has the chance to have similar box office success if the reviews mirror this. I think the box office would be a little bit lower. The only reason I say that is I think the Batman is clearly a much more adult film than this. I think you could take your kids to see this and there's not a lot that would be traumatizing to them. True, Batman, true. There, could, there could definitely be a few things in there where you're like, Ooh, if you got like, <laughs> a six or seven year old, you might be nervous letting them, letting them see it. I think there's, a, and that's, it's, it's deliberate. That's, that's what they're trying to create. But I, I think it'll be, you know, if we assume the pandemic is no worse or whatever, by that point, I certainly think that the Batman could, could generate that kind of buzz. Um, I thought you were actually going to ask me about because I thought you were actually going to ask me about Flashpoint because I feel like I think Flashpoint's got, well the reason I bring it up is because I feel like this movie set a very high bar for this idea of bringing back multiple versions of the same character or versions of older characters we had seen before putting them on screen and having it click and so we obviously know you know, you're going to have Affleck and you're going to have Keaton and you're going to have some of these similar idea of multiple versions of the same character um, on screen in Flashpoint. And I, I don't know that you can do much better than what this film was able to do in that regard. So I'm very curious to see how, how, how they approach that idea. Because Affleck, I think it, he said he never shares the screen with Keaton. I think he sort of said that. So you're not going to have them in the same room the way that you have in, in this movie. So we're skeptical, but I was just, it's just one of those things I was thinking about leaving the theater. Yeah. I don't have a lot of hopes for that movie. <laughs> um, Cause I haven't enjoyed any aspect of the, of those, those characters other than Keaton's. Uh, Batman, uh, Ben Affleck's performance was decent, but 
it, it, I, I guess it always comes down to the writing and then the performances. The performances were, were okay, but they were written poorly. So I think if those two would have matched, I think would've, we would have gotten a great iteration of Flash and and and, and Batman's uh, Bat Ben Affleck's Batman. Um, so I'm not terribly excited as to seeing um, Flashpoint. I know probably Keaton is probably be the best part of it. Yeah, I think I think it really comes down to can Andy Muschietti get something different out of Ezra Miller than we've seen thus far. <sighs> I mean, like, because Tom Holland definitely, we liked Tom Holland's performances more leading up to this movie. But you definitely get a different performance in this movie. This is a much more mature, uh, ranged performance in, in No Way Home than we've ever seen him give. Does, you know, does Ezra Miller have that in him, you know, for this movie? Or is he just going to rehash the same sort of nervous energy, you know, kind of overly wisecracking persona that we've seen, seen to date? I mean, I think if, if unless he makes a leap in this movie, I don't think the movie's gonna work. Yeah, I mean, so he certainly has moments where, of a flash, has moments where, especially considering the 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 story that they're going for, it gives him the opportunity to show his range. Will he be able to? I, I think he can in those parts. But the fl- I think the Flash part, the, that character of the Flash is what he's going to fail. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and I, we'll see. This is coming out next early. Uh, when when next year? No, March? Next summer. Next summer? Yeah. Sure. We'll see. We'll see. Again, I, I, I'd love to be proven wrong. <laughs> but any final thoughts, Brian, on... Well, you know, the, la- the last thought is, you know, we can save the deep, deep dive discussion for, um, for the next news show, but they obviously couldn't have Sam Raimi physically be part of this reunion, so they gave him a trailer at the end of this movie. I felt like that's why you got the full trailers, because Sam Raimi's directing it. Yeah, that yeah, That was yeah. sort of their way of, you know, as opposed to having a Doc Strange cut scene, they actually yeah. just had a full-on teaser. Trailer, yeah. Yeah, to let you know, like, this is what our guy's been doing, you know, the last couple <laughs> of years since coming back. I, the only thing I just wanted to throw out there. I, I hope that you, becomes the norm. Yeah, I I'd hope I'd send you a cryptic text and we can talk about it more on the news show. But I think that that is the Doc Strange from What If. I oh, think, absolutely. I think that you, that's why I said you're going to be rewarded for watching that show because I think it's that dude from those episodes is who you see at the end of that trailer. And I got, I got mad excited when I saw that. <laughs> Because you saw, did, did, did you off. did you did you see the the like the the globs? You know how it made, they didn't. When I saw that, I was like, "Oh snap! They're really doing this." And then when you see that, is this is again? Remember, this is going to supposedly this is going to be their, their their sort of first uh, um, their first try at horror. Mm-hmm. And while well, watching the trailer, you really didn't see that, but you sort of get some inclination that this is going to be a very, very serious, serious sort of film. So this is one certainly to look out for. And I and I've said in, in said this in the past that this movie is 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 is, is going to be huge it could be huge it could be huge um but that's our show for today thank you for joining us once again uh let us know in the comment section below if you liked this film uh do you th- where do you think the future of of tom holland in the mcu uh is going um, would you want to see an Andrew Garfield movie? Um, yeah, let us know in the comment section below. And what do you give it? Do you give it a three out of five, four out of five, two out of five, which is crazy. I don't think any of you would probably give this a two out of five. If you did, then it's like it would never be a good conversation between you and I or us. 
I think even if you hadn't seen any of the old movies, you would still enjoy this just for what I think so. I said, I think so, too. But, you know, not being in on the jokes is always sort of an uncomfortable feeling. If you you don't know, enjoy it more. If you've seen every film up to up to now, you enjoy it more. Yeah. Um, But yeah, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Hit the notification bell with your friends and let's have a, 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 a discussion about what you like, what we like how it all fits together, what the future looks like is always an interesting conversation. Brian, thank you for joining me once again, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report.